Congressman. We'll give my wonderful chief of staff. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm Congressman Grothman's Chief of Staff. Thanks for coming tonight. We're really glad to see all of you here in Port Washington at our 39th town hall since being in office. So um, tomorrow we're going to have our 40th and our 41st, so we're really excited to be here. I'm just going to run through the schedule for tonight just so everyone knows what's going on. We are going to have the Congressman speak for a couple minutes, give you an update on what's going on in D.C. and then also what he's been working on in the district. After that, we are going to take your questions. I believe most of you filled out questions out in front. If you didn't get a sheet to fill out questions, just let one of my staff know and we'll get you a, a piece of paper so you can fill that out. When we ask the questions, I pull them at random out of the bucket um, and then whoever's question it is, I will bring your question over to you. You can ask it to the congressman and the congressman will answer your question. Just a reminder that we don't talk over to, over anyone while they're asking their question or talk over the congressman so that everyone can hear and so that you guys can hear everyone else in the audience. So thank you very much and here's the congressman. This is okay. The last two I didn't have a microphone and you're more compact than the last two. Can you hear me without the microphones? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, we'll, maybe, is that okay? I don't want to look like an ingrate if I'm not using it. Is that okay if I don't use it? Yeah. So, so, well, we'll so Mr. Grossman, we have two citizens here who are deaf. And your interpreter hasn't shown up yet. Um, oh, I'm good. concerned. Uh, well, we can so, make. they're live streaming it. Um, so, you'll need to use the microphone so the camera can pick it up. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess we have a couple of people who are waiting here for an interpreter. Should I wait like three minutes, four minutes? I don't want everybody to wait, but I'll wait. I'll wait three minutes before starting. I do have somewhere I got to get to after this, so I, I eventually got to get out of here. And you know, the last couple we wound up uh, didn't get to everybody's questions, so I don't like to delay it. But I do want to have everybody understand my general comments on what's going on. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll wait just two or three more minutes because if we have an interpreter coming here, I don't want to have everybody miss it. Anybody miss it? What else can I tell you while we're waiting on something not of great substance? Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Thamesville, Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. So this is a cool thing for me. Do we have our interpreter here? No. No. No, not yet. Um, I grew up in Thamesville, Wisconsin, so it's kind of a cool thing for me. I used to ride my bicycle up from Thamesville to, uh, you know, come up and look at the, you know, beautiful shoreline here in Port Washington. So I've been around here my whole life, and it's kind of a cool thing. It's a big district, and um, and I don't want to say I have a favorite part of the district, but um, my mom still lives in Deansville, and I'm down here a lot to see her. So, and I, I don't know, I'll ask you guys, because I don't like to be one, you know, taking sides. Is this the best part of the state? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Is that this thing? Is that caused by this thing? I got it's in my pocket. Okay, yeah. Okay, so that's a little bit about my background. Um, we have a one more minute, and then I'm, I'm afraid I really should start because I don't want to have people at the end not be able to ask and answer questions because we're not getting going here. When did your grandfather come to America or your grandfather? My parents, um, on my mother's side, my ancestors were here quite a while. I know I had somebody fight in the Civil War and that sort of thing, which is kind of cool. Um, my mother grew up in Wauwatosa. My father's from Portage. And his father did was born in Germany. So on my father's side, more recent, he came here in the 1890s um, and worked on the railroad. And his mother grew up in a farm family in Marquette County. So they're kind of more in-district people. And I was born in Milwaukee, but I was raised in Ozaki County in Beansville. So that's a little bit about my background. I was, years ago I used to be a lawyer. And later tonight I'm going to shoot over here. I haven't seen my old law firm. I can't remember the last time I was at my old law firm, but one of my old buddies is retiring today, so I want to get to his retirement party because I haven't seen him in 
Did you know that Abraham Lincoln visited a law office here in Port Washington? Did he? On uh, his uh, campaign trip. Okay. Well, I guess I should start. And I, um, you know, this is something that I guess is, well, probably I'm almost certain might be on the internet somewhere or other. So if somebody misses part of it, uh, you can have somebody interpret it off the internet. I am Glenn Grothman. I'm your congressman. This is the beginning of the third year, uh, third year that I have been in Congress. Uh, been somewhat frustrating, very hard working, uh, a tremendous amount of work in Washington and haven't got as much done as I wish we would have gotten done. I am on three committees. I'm on the Education and Workforce Committee, the Government Oversight Committee, and the Budget Committee. I'll talk a little bit about those committees in a second. We've gotten more done than I think the press reports. Compared to contemporaries, there have been more bills signed by Donald Trump in a comparable period of time. Um, we had a, a, a really good bill passed with regard to the VA. I think one of the problems with the VA is frequently true wherever you look in government. It was very difficult to get rid of a bad employee at the VA. Hopefully we've made some progress there. That was a rewarding thing. We passed several bills dealing with human trafficking, which I think is a good thing. On the Education Committee, uh, this hasn't been taken up in the Senate yet. And it's much more difficult to get a bill through the Senate than the House. But we took up a bill um, which should make it easier for the state and local governments to apply their education to job skills. One of the frustrating things we have out here, we have people who feel that they can't get jobs. Even more frustrating is to run into people who went to college, big student debts, that's, you know, $50,000, $60,000. Maybe they're in their 30s, they don't have a good job. On the other hand, wherever I go in my district, I find people looking for work and not low-paid jobs, high-paying jobs in construction, high-paid jobs in, uh, in manufacturing, and they don't have the skills necessary to do those jobs. So the federal government finally recognizes this. If you all have any children or grandchildren out there, make sure that if they're 18 years old, they're taking the job path towards getting a job not just a general degree, because you don't want to wind up 30 years old with $30,000 in debt. That was a good thing that we did. Um, so overall, we passed a lot of bills. Some of the high-profile things that you expected us to get done have not gotten done yet. That's very frustrating for me. Some of that is because the way the congressional process works, you wouldn't expect them to get done until at least September, but at least with regard to the Obamacare or Affordable Care Act, it's frustrating and hasn't been done yet. I think some people in Washington have to learn they have to compromise. I voted for two proposals which were kind of designed to replace the Affordable Care Act. Um, I voted for one in committee and a different one on the floor. I fully expected to vote for uh, a replacement coming out of the Senate, but I went over to that Senate tonight, and as you know, um, all the Democrats voted against the placeholder bill, and three Republicans kind of surprised us, showing that they couldn't compromise. I'm a little frustrated on the Affordable Care Act because I think Mitch McConnell could, if he fought, have gotten something through the Senate. Uh, John McCain voted against that bill, but his public reasons for voting against the bill were that we didn't have committee hearings and we didn't have a, uh, a congressional budget office in office estimate. If you really wanted to do something, and I was Mitch McConnell, I would have said, okay, John McCain, we're going to have some committee hearings in August. We're going to get a congressional budget office estimate. And when we get those, we're going to take another vote in September, and then we'll move on. The fact that he didn't do it bothers me. Another thing that bothers me is right now, I don't think there's been a lot of push out of the House. One of the things that's frustrating about Congress compared to the state legislature, and of course I represented Port Washington in the state legislature, is that the House and Senate do not communicate as much as they should. In Madison, the assemblymen, the senators, your Senator Dewey Strobel and Rob Brooks, I'm sure they see each other all the time. You're on the rotunda, they're walking back and forth, they're having dinner together. There is not enough coordination between the Senate and the House in Congress. and I. I've tried to change that. I think we always ought to have a representative from the Senate in the room when the House meets and vice versa. I have not made, you know, I've not gotten what I want there. But to me, since ultimately the health care replacement is going to have to pass both houses, 
we should always have a core group of three or four people in the House working with the Senate so we finally do something we're able to get things done. Ultimately, something is going to have to be done because we have a huge number of counties in this country in which there's only one health care provider under Obamacare. Obviously, we only have one health care provider. It kind of sets up a monopoly. It's going to cause that price to go through the roof. There are even probably going to be some counties that eventually have no health care provider, in which case Obamacare is completely collapsed. So uh, we're going to have to do something sooner or later. I would rather do it sooner than later, but we will have to see right now. The position of House leadership is they're going to wait for the Senate to do something, and we'll see how quickly the Senate moves on that. That's where we stand on that issue. With regard to tax reform, in Congress we have a unique thing in that the Senate will not move most things without 60 votes. When people say, why don't the Republicans get it done, why don't the Republicans get it done, we have a 52-48 majority, that's not 60 votes. It means we have to have the Democrats sign off. There are only a few things we are able to do with 50 votes in the Senate. Um, I'll, I'll digress because one of the things that we were able to do is we were able to undo 15 regulations that Barack Obama had tried to put in effect at the end of his term. And one of the few things you can do with 51 votes in the Senate, we are able to undo those regulations. We undid 15 of those regulations. Prior to this, there was only one time that that provision was used. So we've been active, I think, in the area of getting regulations off businesses back. Those individual regulations are sometimes boring in nature and sometimes only affect one business, so you don't hear about it a lot. In any event, one of the things we can do with 51 votes is tax reform, but we have to pass a budget resolution saying on tax reform, we can do things with 51 votes in the Senate. Um, the budget resolution is not passed yet. I think we will probably pass a, uh, a budget resolution in September, and then we'll begin to work on some sort of tax plan. There have been two tax plans thrown out there. One is the Ways and Means tax plan that supposedly the House is supposed to get behind. The other tax plan is a Trump tax plan. Neither one has the details filled in. If you know anything about taxes, it's important to get the details. I am a little bit disappointed with both of them because I don't think either plan does enough to target the middle class. Um, I think in our society we do a lot for people who sometimes don't want to work as hard as they should. And obviously the very wealthy are very wealthy. Um, and people look out for them, but sometimes we don't look out for the middle class. I've been very, very outspoken in Washington um, about the house plan kind of treating investment income much better than they treat working person's income. I don't think it's right if somebody is a, you know, is in a position um, who's a, a nurse, a truck driver, a welder, what have you, that they would pay taxes at a higher rate than you would on some investment income. I'm trying to work on that. Donald Trump has also weighed in in that regard. I'm glad that he did and I agree with Donald Trump and his disagreements with Republican leadership on the way a tax plan should look. Uh, Donald Trump's initial plan, I think, also had the potential to kind of discriminate against the working guy. I made that clear with Steve Mnuchin, and I think I'm getting progress from President Trump on that. Um, with regard to welfare reform, which I think is so important in our country, not only is it as expensive, but I think we are hurting people and that we are paying them not to work as hard as they could or achieve their full potential. I think we are also discouraging people from getting married right now. Um, initially, Paul Ryan had planned to take up some welfare reform next year. Um, most recently, he has told me he would rather do something like that this year. I don't think we've communicated enough with the, on the Senate with that, but at least Republican leadership is looking at welfare reform in particular, when they deal with it, I'd like to begin to get rid of the marriage penalties. It is not difficult to come up with hypotheticals in which people are losing twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year by getting married. That is just plain wrong. I mean, in a society which makes such a big deal about treating everybody equally and not discriminating against anybody, to say that a married couple or two people who say single, you know, they're over twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars apart in government benefits is just ridiculous on its face. And I hope Congress begins to address that. Okay, there's a little bit about what's going on. We also, uh, 
in the future pass several bills in the House that have not gotten out of the Senate dealing with regulatory reform. Anybody in business or farming who deals with the DNR or the Environmental Protection Agency or anybody in business who deals with the Department of Labor knows that frequently the biggest problems they have are not the taxes they pay, though that's a big enough problem, but the regulations they have to comply with, the huge amount of paperwork they have to deal with. And we have tried to pass bills out of the House that I hope the Senate takes up, saying that in the future, if big regulations come out, costing tens of millions of dollars, those regulations have to be approved by Congress. Right now, once an administration decides to come up with new administrative rules, they can go ahead with whatever Congress does. So, there's a little bit of a background as far as what's going on. Now we have a situation here in which I believe some of you, most of you probably, filled out questions. Rachel is going to hand. Do we have our tur what color is that? Turquoise or what color is that? Purple. Purple, okay. I'm somewhat colorblind. Uh, okay, out of the purple bucket, we have a variety of questions. She's going to pull them out at random, and we'll see how many people I can get through. And some of these don't have questions on them. That's why when I pull them out, yeah. I don't and, have and just out of a sense of fairness, Please don't interrupt the person who's talking. I mean, everybody's trying to do it right. We want to get through as many people as possible. And in the last couple of times, some people, you know, like there's a kid in the kindergarten class who can't resist raising their hand, me, me, me. They, they don't let me finish talking. They don't let the person asking the question finish talking. So we'll see if we can be disciplined. Okay. Robert Roy? Yes. I was going to say, I know it's about you. I'd like your thoughts about universal health care in terms of uh, expanding Medicare greatly where the minimum age becomes zero and there's a single payer. you have some thoughts? Um, I don't like the government running all of health care. You know, one of the reasons America is the envy of the world, the reason everybody's trying to get in here, is in other areas of our economy the government has kind of stayed out. And to say that in this area of the economy the appropriate way to handle it is having the government all in on the face that it doesn't make any sense. I think right now we don't have a pure, even a remotely uh, free market situation in the American health care, which is why American health care costs are so high. As a matter of fact, I think the two things that are most difficult for the middle class right now in America are health care and the cost of education. And both of those things are um, both of those things have already have heavy government involvement in it. If you look at a country like Canada, which is a single payer, I mean, you talk to people along the border and people are coming from Canada and procedures done here in the United States. So I think the goal shouldn't be to have more government involvement. The goal should be to have the type of free market principles that should result in more choice and lower costs in America. The example I always use is cosmetic surgery. Cosmetic surgery does not have the government involved in it because government programs don't cover it. And uh, quite frankly, most em employer health care doesn't cover it. But over time, the cost of cosmetic surgery has fallen. At least, I'm not sure exactly, but subjectively, it seems that there are more people offering it. Okay, if by having the government not involved, the cost of cosmetic surgery drops, somehow we've got to cause that same drop in cost and even maybe more providers happen with regard to hip replacements or heart surgeries or other things. Can I add, just add to that about health, universal health care? Because my well, question was that too. Well, I, I, I just want Christine, you, you, Jen. That's right. I, that's well, right. That was just coincidence that you were the next one. Yeah, but, okay. but I, I, I want to get mad at you. Okay, I, I just wanted to say something to clarify something. Um, my, myself and my family have traveled quite a bit. Yeah. And uh, I've been to a number of different country, uh, countries that have had different type of health care. Now, Canada has a wonderful health care program. And I know what you're saying. I mean, sure, if you want to have uh, plastic surgery and a number of different things done, uh, that's fine. You can get insurance for that. But my, my mother was in a head-on car crash up in Canada. I've had family that have been a number of different things. They were treated with a lot of respect. The way they have it set up is that, first of all, they pay for it. Then they, they take care of you from then on. I mean, they have universal health care. 
Everybody, I think, needs health care. I think everybody should have it. The way Paul Ryan has written it, okay, we're writing, we're writing out all of these different things in Obamacare, but I think what we should have done is tried to try to repair Don oh, Obamacare. But universal care, I think, is even more important. England likes theirs. France likes theirs. <coughs> They've done. They have done. They have done uh, scales on uh, what. Give us a from you. I just want to let you know that we have been through a number of different things, and and what we have found is that in different countries, I can tell you a number of different accidents, things that have happened to us, and we have been treated with great respect. We haven't paid any bills, and I think that this is important for everybody. And we have one of the richest countries, what is really in, in the world. And here we are. And, 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 and the problem is, is that we're it's the envy of the world. I know, and that's right. And, and, we're the, and, and I tell you, the insurance companies, the health companies, and the medicine, yes, they are, they are getting rich on us because we don't have, a, you know, some sort of a universal idea about things. And I think that people are worth it. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I mean, why should there, why should there be millions of people that don't get uni, or don't get health care? I mean, I, I don't understand it, and I don't understand why we can't do it. Um, the world, we should be able to. There are people from Canada who come here for health care. What, 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 what type of services are they getting? Canada. Good services, top of the line services. That's why people in Canada come here okay. for their surgeries, for their most technical things because they know America's got the best health care. And I, I just think that America is a free country. Okay, quote Ronald Reagan, our forefathers didn't come here to, to duplicate Europe. Um, the reason America works so well is because the free market and everything else. But for some reason, people insist that in health care, the most arguably the most important thing we deal with, all of a sudden we're going to say free market principles don't work. And on the face of it, that doesn't make any sense. No, Next. you know, they, they can't, you went to the, they went to the, the Congress. They're concerned about social security and some of the changes that are being proposed or some of the things that they see that are changing in social security. I'm not sure what changes in Social Security you're talking about. As far as Social Security retirement, uh, Donald Trump himself has said he doesn't expect to do anything during his first term. Maybe he'll make the promise during his second term, too, if something like that would happen. But he's not, he doesn't plan on making changes in his first term. So it's not something I am addressing right now or devoting a whole lot of time to, to be honest. Okay, next. Um, we have Joseph Robinson. Yes. Joe? Which one's Joe? Hi. Okay. Well, <laughs> go ahead. Okay. I, can, I can raise my voice. Yeah, raise your voice. <laughs> um, so, I, um, there's a issue that has, <laughs> there's an issue that has um, sort of been, um, kind of neglected uh, recently, and that's the issue of net neutrality. Have you heard of net neutrality at all? Yeah, we, I, I have not. Uh, we had put a statement out a while ago on that. There was what nothing was been before the legislature recently yeah. on it, so what was I your have not, on that? not changed uh, any position on it. Um, and that's all I'm going to say for now. So what is the position? Is what your position? I have no stated position right now on it. What is your position? <laughs> I just wanted to. Um, I just wanted to say that it's a big, it's a much bigger deal than I think a lot of people are giving you credit for. I mean, the internet runs our country. It, it, it I mean, it, it's sort of. Um, it was a utility under Title II, but they redacted that. Um, it influences all our lives so much, um, regardless of whether or not we use it directly. I mean, our businesses do, our, our hospitals do, and um, the idea of giving your internet service provider the power to slow down certain websites or block political candidates' websites or, 
or block your own business's website if you want if you want to start a business. I mean, it would since we're we're so supportive of of businesses and everything in this country, and the idea of getting rid of net neutrality would just decimate business and so many things that, that Republicans stand for. So I don't know exactly why many Republicans are supporting it when it does so much damage. Okay. Or supporting cutting it. Robert Schmalz. Okay. Um, I, uh, I had a question on Obamacare. What I, I, I don't understand why there is such a problem with repealing it or getting rid of the, some of the mandates. We didn't have to do any legislation to start uh, uh, to, to, or to have uh, health insurance companies come into business. Why do we need any legislation? Why, don't I mean, we why have we got something done yet? Well, that, that's, uh, that's a big part of it. Uh, I mean, it, it, I think you're overcomplicating it. I think you could, if you just got rid of it, and let the well, private uh, as you free market. Know, or maybe you don't know, but as you know, in the Senate, they had a straight up and down vote on whether we'd repeal it, and they couldn't get to 51 votes. Uh, there were, I can't remember what were there, six or seven no votes on the straight repeal in the Senate. Um, the difficult thing is this, and I have voted for two compromise bills so far, but on the one hand, there are people who feel we just ought to repeal it, and let the free market work. But right now, a lot of people are on insurance because of Obamacare, and they're given percentage of congressmen who, are, who do not want to vote for a plan in which somebody is getting some coverage now and are going to lose that coverage. Okay, that's just political reality. Okay, in the House plan, we had 20 or 21 votes um, against the plan that I voted for, and 17 all but three of people who voted no, I don't like labels, would be considered moderate Republicans, and only three are what you'd call conservative Republicans. So we barely got any plan out of the House with already 17 or 18 Republicans voting no because they felt in the House plan, in which we still do have government subsidies for health insurance, was not generous enough. It is not surprising in the Senate with 52 Republicans in which three people can kill a plan, in which uh, they had a hard time getting to 50. Like I said, I think if Mitch McConnell wanted to, I, I'd like to think they can get some sort of plan out of the Senate or some sort of compromise plan, but once people are used to getting something from the government, it's very hard to take it away. And a lot of those senators didn't want to, enough of those senators didn't want to take away anything that I don't think you're going to get what you want. And quite frankly, the same thing is true in the House. So what we've got to do is we've got to focus on cost more than anything. Because the whole problem with, with medical care, I don't know if they're talking about Medicare that's going to go broke eventually, if we don't do changes, whether you're talking about Medicaid, whether you're talking about employer-provided health insurance, or whether you're talking about you know the individual market, we've got to hold down cost. And we... Um, I don't think either plan adequately addressed that. And if you hold down health care costs in this country by 15 or 20 percent, you've really solved all the problems. Individual businesses are able to do it. They do it to a certain extent with um, employee-based clinics. They do it with educating their employees on where different procedures cost, more or less. Um, they do it with bargaining on individual procedures. So it can be done. I also believe on Medicare, the amount we spend on Medicare per person is less here than it does in places like New York and, my, and, and Florida. And to a certain extent, that's because the physicians in other places, um, when they make subjective decisions on what to do, quite frankly, do more procedures, which is more costly. So uh, that is kind of the situation and why we haven't been just able to repeal it. Okay, I mean, I've voted many times to repeal it in the past years, but you're not going to get 218 votes in the House for a straight repeal, and you're not going to get 
50 votes in the Senate. And we can see it because they tried to take the vote and they didn't. You can say there were individual senators who went back on the way they voted last year or back on their campaign promises, but that's what they did. And I've got to deal in reality. Mac Freiberg? I'm sorry. Is that? It's Mark. Mark, sorry. Sorry. Congressman Grossman, I just would like to say thank you. Um, on your years ago, when you first ran for the Senate, you had on there fighting for our values, right? And you you represent my values, and I, I'm just here to say thank, thank you. you for that. Um, I know you guys, Republicans and conservatives, have faced a lot of opposition, a lot of it very ugly and sad to see in America. And I just want want to tell you and encourage you to keep going, doing what you're doing, and I'm behind you. And so is two to one in Ozaki County and those people that voted you in. So know that. Well, thank you. We keep trying to trying to go. Didn't get the question there, but thank you for what you said. It sounded good. Leslie Paulus, I'd like to understand why there can't be a, a bipartisan, objective, grown-up, adult, intelligent conversation about health care that that is able to discuss the European models of health care, understand the cost, the state, in real terms, the cost that, that per capita that some of these Western countries pay, as compared to us. Because there are a lot of people here who are, while we may have health care, who are also suffering a price hike in the, in the, um, um, in the, the effect of high uh, deductibles. So that we don't have access to health care like we should, like we, we used to. And, and, and as far as saying that you can't get the, it through the, the Senate because of Mitch McConnell or anything, that's ridiculous. Because you guys had many, many years to figure something out. And you had nothing, no plan whatsoever. So don't even try to well, tell us that the, the people who you work for, that you have something that you are going to try to get shoved down our throats. You have nothing you have offered. Absolutely zero on the table. No details. Well, and no discussion and, and, like adults. And actually, like I said, I, I voted on two different plans to replace Obamacare myself. Um, as far as bipartisan, there's this myth up there, I think, that nothing gets done on a bipartisan basis. The vast majority of things in Congress are done on a bipartisan basis. As I mentioned, it requires 60 votes to get most things through the Senate, including appropriation bills, which is, I guess, what you'd say the equivalent of our budget. And one of the things that sometimes, quite frankly, frustrates me, any of the big appropriation bills that have been passed inside there. This is not my there, question. This is not my question. My question no, is no, about no, health care. No. And you, you, I you. want to know why we are not discussing, as a country, what other countries are doing. Well, we, Just we, like we you do discuss do it. Any kind of a business. And you would say, this is what this country offers, what they pay per capita, how their plans work. This is, and what do we do? We don't discuss any details whatsoever. I, I want details. Well, well, first of all, you said that why can't the Republicans and Democrats get together? There I am responding to something that I think is very common out there, because I've got the question in the past, why don't Republicans and Democrats get together? They get together all of the time. I don't want that. Not, I don't want to know that. I want well, to know what are the details of a health care plan that you guys can talk about together well, we, and, we, and put some details out there. I we, want had to speak we had two detailed plans. We had a plan that passed the House Budget Committee. We had a plan that passed the House on the floor. But that was not governance, sir. That was trying to shove something ridiculous down the throats of the American public. Well, I, I mean, that's your opinion. Um, I felt at the time that we passed a bill out of the House that we were going to get a bill back from the Senate. We don't have the bill back out of the Senate yet. I hope the Senate continues to work on something. And it's a bill that you all agree you would dislike and you don't want to have passed. Well, well, so we, will see, we, we will see what happens in the Senate. Like I said, I believe as Obamacare collapses, it will create more of a sense of urgency in the Senate and they will wind up passing something. And then you, I wish they will do it. Well, I don't know what it will be because the Senate is working but on that's it. That's why I, I want you guys to do your jobs because we want to know what it will be. Well, like every like every piece of legislation, it's subject to compromise, subject to different people weighing in. 
Uh, I'd like to know, we'll because see. I want to know, I think that health care is, well, is not a commodity. It is a human well, right. It is not something that is a free market thing like grain. Okay, you well, would you would not throw the national defense to free market wins to say that's what makes us great. Well, there are I, certain roles that the government plays, and one of them is to support the the, the future. Well, of our I, I think the government even right now is very involved in health care. As you know, we have Medicare. As you know, we have Medicaid. Um, as you know, we subsidize. We kind of you would call it a subsidy of health care and that if your employer pays for your health care you don't pay income taxes on that coverage. So in a lot of ways the government is involved right now and we will see what the Senate comes back with in a plan. You have two plans right now to look at and more is going to happen in the future, I believe. Adele Riker? Yeah, let's get off the subject of health care for a moment. <laughs> Some of us agree and don't. Um, President Trump's budget proposed, and this is <coughs> Wisconsin specifically, right. cuts the Great Lakes Restoration Project. As you know, I took the leadership, maybe you don't know, I took the leadership role in making sure that the money from the uh, Great Lakes Initiative was back in the budget. And it's back in the uh, budget was passed by the House Appropriation Committee. So, and there was a specific provision in the budget as opposed to the appropriation bill asking the appropriation to put all that money back in there. And quite frankly, it was successful. And then it was, I was more successful than I imagined. Because given how broke we are, I was going to expect they'd say, well, okay, Glenn, I don't know you like all the money back in there, but we give you 80%. Instead, they put 100% back in there. Now, of course, we eventually have to deal with the Senate. But I can tell you in the House, it was all restored. Okay. Um, I, I mean, just the Great Lakes is the largest freshwater body in the world, and we're polluting it every day. We've got nuclear waste in there, and everything is unbelievable. I, and I, if it if it fails, if that fails, we're done. Th there's no question. And like I said, if you look at the budget, there was a provision in there asking the Appropriation Committee to restore the Great Lakes Emission Initiative. It was my provision, so I understand the importance of the Great Lakes very well. And uh, hopefully that'll stay in there when we get done well, negotiating Mike. with the Senate. Mike. Catherine Brown. Thank you. Sorry, this was not my original question, but okay. in defense of the Canadian system. Okay. <laughs> I have to tell you, my husband was Canadian. Okay. <laughs> there was no way that he could move here because of his health situation. He had Parkinson's disease. He died last year, and I have no question that he got the best health care that he could have had. And it would have been the same health care that, that anybody in Canada would have received, even though he was actually fairly well-to-do and could certainly have afforded to pay more. But he didn't have to. And the same thing applied when he went into a nursing home where the, the rate is a flat rate, there is none of this explosion of cost when you have to go into a nursing home so that you end up on Medicaid. Um, it is a flat cost, you do not pay more. It doesn't matter where you go or what kind of things you need. Uh, so I, I'm afraid okay. I feel that your condemnation of the uh, Canadian system, the people that come here who want to come here for cosmetic surgery or because they can get their Needs replaced a little faster than they can in Canada. Right. Okay, they can pay for it. Fine, they can pay whatever it charges here. Right. But the average person in Canada, there is no way that they will come here. That's right. So please, correct. Really not. Well, like I said, when I talk to people whose districts are on the border, they tell me Canadians coming here for health care. Only if they can. We don't need any more stuff. I work in a health care. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm a, I work in a health. I work in a healthcare for the last 35 years. I'm, I come from a social medicine from Italy. I do business with 65 countries overseas in Canada. I'm sorry to say, your husband was lucky. He was lucky, but the rest of the people oh. suffered. No, no. Sorry, I can tell you what. We're not going to get into the side of the no, no, well, we got, I'm sure we have. Looks like Rachel's got a fistful of questions yet. I would like to just make one quick question, which was my original question, which was how do you feel about uh, President Trump's. Um, 
pardon of uh, the uh, sheriff down there in Arizona? I, I'm not a big fan of a lot of presidential pardons. Um, I think if you go back, though, and look at the last hundred pardons that not only President Trump, but Barack Obama or George Bush gave, I think you'll find a lot more evil person than Sheriff Joe in the mix now. When I look about what Sheriff, I, I, I don't want to pronounce his last name because I don't even know how to screw it up. They're all playing. Um, but uh, there are things he did that are clearly wrong, somewhat sloppy. I, I'm assuming what President Trump did is he looked at all the local officials who are even coming out basically saying that we're sanctuary cities or sanctuary counties and undermining our efforts in enforcing our immigration laws. And I assume, and you can read his statement, that he felt that since we have so many people who are brazenly almost encouraging people to break the immigration laws, that when somebody tries to enforce the immigration laws, we're not going to criminalize his behavior. Um, like I said, uh, Sheriff Joe is not a, a saint at all, and I think a lot of people in Arizona had problems with him, but I think he probably felt that he was um, being discriminated against a little bit for his political position. <laughs> That's ironic. <laughs> 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 I had the opportunity of going across country the last two weeks from, from Virginia to Wisconsin. And along the way, I would see billboards saying, call this number, we want Congress to support Trump's budget. Um, as a representative, I would hope that you would not only represent who you have said two to one in Mazaki County, but you would represent all of us. I watch on TV where I don't know if we're in a campaign right now. I, I don't think we're being represented. And I would like to know immigration, the law, the things that are in wow. in right now, the budget, Trump's budget. I am. Um, um, it, it's ridiculous. It'll be four point five billion if we pass this, with having the wall, with having attorneys, with having detention centers, etc. I would like to know if you're going to represent all of us on the budget. Thank you. Well, I always talk to everybody, don't I? That's why we're having the meeting. Um, I haven't seen any billboards about Donald Trump's budget. I just got home. I just got home. Okay, so you saw and, them in Virginia. And they're there. They're okay. There. Um, right now, Congress will wind up spending, I, I think, certainly over $70 billion more than Donald Trump wanted in the budget. It is always easy to spend other people's money. Uh, Donald Trump wanted, a, I think it was a 5.5% increase in defense spending. I think by the time it's done, Congress is going to vote for an increase of over 9%. I think Donald Trump wanted a, about a 7% cut in non-defense. I think we're going to have a cut of about 1.2%. We have a huge problem in this country in that we have $20 trillion, we have a $20 trillion debt. Um, we are going to be borrowing 13 or 14% this year. I give Donald Trump a tremendous amount of credit for trying to make a run at the out of control spending here. And Congress was not up to the up to snuff on that. I'm not sure who put up those billboards, but I will tell you Congress will be nowhere near, in my opinion, as re fiscally responsible as Donald Trump was. There were individual things in his budget I didn't like. I went to bat on the Great Lakes Initiative because we had no business zeroing that out and I'm glad they put the money back in appropriations committee. But you have to ask yourself this, the day is going to come in which we are so broke that we will no longer be the world's reserve currency and then it's going to be big trouble. So most of the criticisms of Donald Trump's budget, be it military or non-military, is that he was spending too little money. And the day is going to come, like I said, 10 years, 20 years from now, I don't know, in which people are going to say, geez. I wish we had listened more to Donald Trump on the overall level of spending in 2017. I, I suggest that you go online. There's different websites you can see specifically 
Donald Trump's um, budget, right. and you'll see that it affects we're, we're, us more yeah, than anyone. We're spending way more than Donald Trump ever dreamed in this budget. I mean, he hasn't got out of the Senate yet, mm -hmm. but I will tell you, I think by the time it gets out of the Senate, it is going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be sad because I think people were waiting a long time for the Republicans to be in charge. And we talk about repealing Obamacare and talk about tax reform and talk about welfare reform. I think you were hoping the Republicans would take care of that. But I think one thing that almost anybody would be as expected is the Republicans were going to be responsible on the overall level of debt and overall level of spending. And I think spending is going to go up considerably more than Donald Trump wanted. Ann Murphy? I think we have a chance there. Okay. Leslie Paulus? That's me again. Okay. I'd like to know if you believe, and I'm glad about the Great Lakes policies, right. okay? But I'd like to know if you believe that my grandchildren are going to thank the Republican Party and Donald Trump for the environmental policies that they're putting in place here. You think, do you I think our environment is so much cleaner now than in the past. And right now we have a problem in this country in that our economy could be doing better. We've lost a lot of manufacturing jobs. I think if you look at air quality or water quality, we are now much cleaner than we were 30 years ago or 40 years ago when I was growing up around here. We are not going to go backward in that regard, but sometimes there's a lack of common sense a lot a lack of cost-benefit analysis that puts American business at a, at a disadvantage. I think there are people out there who don't care about the cost of energy, and they don't care if people's electric bill goes up or not. And I think Donald Trump has been putting the brake on some of the more extreme um, environmental regulations that people have tried to put in the past. So right now along here, along the Great Lakes in particular, uh, you know, businesses have to have to put a lot more money into fighting air pollution to trying to hold down ozone, even though the uh, the pollutants that cause it are coming up from Chicago. I hope Donald Trump is able to kind of rein in the EPA in those regards. I don't like it that American manufacturing is a competitive competitive disadvantage in Ozaki County compared to other countries compared to other states and even compared to other parts of the state of Wisconsin. We do not have a hope of turning around those regulations unless we have somebody like Donald Trump in there as president. So, so you, you want us to set our bar against countries like no, China? No, 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 and, no. And what about but the Paris, what about a little the bit Paris of cost-benefit analysis. The what? What, about the, what about the Paris Climate oh. Accord? Well, that wasn't binding anyway, but I'll tell you, it was the United States our laws right now are a lot cleaner than laws in many places around the world. And I don't see any reason why we want to be bound by um, international agreements um, when we are, I think, doing a quite good job. I don't think we're an outlier. No, we're, we're the envy of the planet. Um, thank you. Um, we are, we are co-non-signatories with Nicaragua and Syria on the Paris Peace Accord. Yeah, yeah. Take it from there on that. And yeah, I read your letter. I read your letter in the press, and the two people who responded to you, I think, were very eloquent in finding that this might have been written by a fifth grader, for all they can tell. <laughs> Clean energy is the future. It's the future for my granddaughter. It's for the future for all the grandchildren in this room. Now, I think for what it's worth, I think the power plant here in Port Washington is very clear. I think it's so far oh, away cleaner than whatever we had here. Can I, can I ask a question? 30 years. I'm just saying, I think to say that, you know, the. Why the port do we have cleaner plant. air, cleaner water? Because we have the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Why do we have alternate energy? in this country, 65,000 coal miners. Why do you want people to go underground nowadays anyway and get miners disease, you know what I mean? No, my real question is, because the 800 pound gorilla in this room is dying, Trump. Uh, I went online today and I, was, I, I picked up somebody who said, what's the biggest Trump lie since the election? Anybody? 
Tell us the answer. The yeah. answer is yeah. the, the Oath of Office. <laughs> yeah. 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 Which gets me to my question. Come on. We go back to Joe Arapaio. Come on. Did he get called to ask a question or just pop up here? My question. Joe, Joe Arapaio was pardoned after having committed contempt of court. Now, if you look at the 1925 Supreme Court decision, certainly somebody can pardon for criminal contempt. What Donald Trump done, did is he, well, we know Arapaio was a very big supporter of Donald. They're, they're bosom buddies. And he actually asked the Secretary of uh, the Attorney General Sessions to get rid of this case. And Jeff Sessions said he would not do it. Now my concern is, are you aware, can you repeat to me the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution? Uh, the top my you have, you have, you're a lawyer, you have some general idea, you slept through What's your constitutional question? law yeah. class. Can, can you ask a question? You take time from other people. You take time from other people. The Fourth Amendment protects people from unfair search and seizure. Right. A federal court, a federal court judge told Arapaio he had to cease and desist. He went on for 17 months. The Justice Department finally said contempt. Well, my, my point being. He was enforcing the law. Right. He was enforcing the law. Well, but he and they were illegal too. We have what we call a profiling in this country. I, I think a couple of comments. I again didn't, didn't get a question there, but I guess you want my general opinion of President Trump. The question is, when are you going to stand up? Paul Ryan did today. Well, I don't. I don't know what he said. I don't know what he said. I don't know what Paul Ryan said today. Um, I have disagreed with President Trump on some individual cuts in his budget, the Great Lakes Initiative being one of them. I have disagreed with President Trump on the volume and tenor of his tweets. Um, the one time I met with him, I talked to him very forcefully on that because I sometimes think that's not very presidential. There are other things like I talked about on tax reform where I think Donald Trump is weighing in and making sure these tax cuts are part of the middle class more than the tax cuts that were proposed by the House of Representatives. Okay, so there are times where I think you're going to disagree with Donald Trump, and there are times in which you're going to agree with Donald Trump. Overall, I think whether you look at government's overall level of government spending, including defense spending, I think when you look at the tax proposal, I think when you notice that we finally have a president who wants us to um, take our immigration laws seriously, and I think in the past we haven't, I think Donald Trump is going to be a very good president. Now, obviously, he's a little unorthodox. He doesn't come across like a normal politician, and sometimes he's a little bit rough around the edges. But I, like I said, I think on tax cuts, I think on welfare, I hope eventually on welfare reform, I think on immigration reform, I think on the size of the budget deficit, I think he's going to be doing a good job on those things, a lot better job than not just his immediate predecessor, but his predecessors before that. I do think he hurts himself popularity-wise with his tweets and that sort of thing, and I've told him that, and I wish he would stop that. Steve Shield. I, uh, I just wish everyone in Washington, the Republicans and the Democrats, would all work together and I know I talk, I live in another congressional district, and I told that to my congressman. I used to work in heavy industry, and when we had a problem, about whether it's Medicare or environments or some of or whatever, we'd all work together. We'd say, guys, we've got to get in a conference room, we've got to get things done. And you said it yourself, uh, you know, just isn't enough communication. I'm not blaming you, you're not the problem. It's just the, the system, and I remember, reading uh, with Sam Rayburn, mm -hmm. a saint almost in, in our history, whatever, at 5 o'clock, he would get out his bottle of bourbon, put it on his conference table, people would come in and start hammering stuff out. You know, say, I'll give you a post office if you give me your vote on this, or, or I'll, I'll give you the marina that you want if you 
Give me this information as well. Whatever it um, is. And I'll tell you, I'll even buy you the bottle of bourbon. <laughs> okay, so, well, I, 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 I'm not going to remember all peoples have said, so I'm going to tell Alex over there when we leave, uh, make sure bourbon. <laughs> People of Port Washington want bourbon. Um, I, I will say this seriously. You know, there's this appealing that we're not getting things done because we don't get along. Since I have been in Congress, there has been a very all-encompassing and expensive, I might add, Medicare reform bill that passed on a bipartisan basis. There was a very expensive but bipartisan transportation bill that passed on a very bipartisan basis. As long as the Senate has their 60 rule, every appropriation bill, which is largely, I think, what Lane would refer to the budget, we don't call it the budget, but that's really what it is, has to pass on a bipartisan basis. I think the reason people don't know so much happens on a bipartisan basis is because if something passed on a bipartisan basis, there are not a bunch of arguments to cover. So, but the vast majority of things have to pass on a bipartisan basis. Now, I'll also tell you something else. The cost of doing things on a bipartisan basis is frequently very, very expensive. Because you mentioned, let's sit down and deal. And what happens is they do deal. If you spend more here, and I spend more here, and this is important to you there, we'll get it done. Well, we're $20 trillion in debt. And that $20 trillion in debt largely was built up on a bipartisan basis, which is a problem. I mean, from what I've seen, just so you understand, we get along well. I don't think we drink a lot of bourbon. <laughs> but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about how the Packers are going to do this year, or what you've done in your family vacation, or blah, 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 blah. And at the end of the day, they spend too much money. And a lot of the reason they spend too much money is they're doing stuff on a bipartisan basis. And people begin to say, if you spend more here, and you spend more here, and you spend more here, we're going to get it done, and we're going to lose our country on all this bipartisan spending. And I mean, I'm there. That's, that's part of the problem. Um, and like I said, I, the appropriation bills we passed this year, we, we're going to pass them out of the House. But when they come back from the Senate, it's going to have to be bipartisan stuff all the way. And I think that's one of the reasons why you know, I'll tell you what's going to happen. We're going to have, I think, maybe hope that I'm wrong, we're going to have something like a 9 plus percent increase in military spending and some sort of increase in non-military spending. And we're going to be near record levels again and an overall increase. And the reason we're doing it is because we all want to be bipartisan. And that, that is just part of the problem. And I, I consider myself, you know, somebody I can deal with the Democrats. I ran into some good Democrat the other day from Menashe who, who reminded me of one of my great victories in the state legislature when I teamed up with the Democrats to, uh, to allow dental hygienists to work on poor people. It was a great thing. And a lot of the other Republicans weren't there. I did it. I got, maybe got my Republican leadership mad at me. But I'm not afraid to be bipartisan. But a lot of times bipartisan means, kind of like you described, you spend more here, you spend more here, you spend more here, and everybody is happy because spending more on their thing. Okay, next. Julie Sharp. So, well, this is regarding health care, again, and I, I was really relieved to hear you say that you wanted to continue to find a resolution and not right. just let Obamacare die. Right. Um, is, what are those things that Republicans and Democrats can reach consensus on? With regard to health care? Yeah. Um, it's an example of the problem because I think the Democrats across the board want more government involvement and more mandates. By mandates, I mean they want to require health insurance companies to do this or that. Uh, the Republicans, or at least the more or less government Republicans, they look at individual mandates and they say, maybe you shouldn't have to pay for them. Or maybe certain pharmaceutical coverages shouldn't be required. And that's a problem. I think both sides agree that you cannot go back to what the law was 10 years on pre-existing conditions. Now, if you want to seriously address health care costs, and if you want private insurance companies involved, you really can't just say, 
anybody who wants can go without insurance for 10 years and if their doctor tells them they need surgery next week, they can go in and tell the insurance company to pay for it. That's one of the reasons Obamacare is falling apart. But I think something will be done on pre-existing conditions so we don't go back to where we were 10 years ago. That's something that I think you can pretty much take to the bank. Marilyn Papp? Um, my question is that uh, President Trump has said he will shut down the government if the pay for the wall is not included in the budget. What are your thoughts on that and what is other people in your party thinking about? That? Well, President, um, as I said, on appropriation bills, and that's what he's talking about, you don't get an appropriation bill done without Chuck Schumer, Mitch McConnell, and Paul Ryan signing off, and as a practical matter, Nancy Pelosi. So it's going to have to be bipartisan. Um, I think Donald Trump ran on the wall. I think we have an immigration problem in this country. And hopefully Chuck Schumer will agree that as part of this massive appropriation bill, or omnibus bill, which it might wind up being in the end, um, that he will be willing to compromise and allow some money in there for a while. Uh, obviously, everybody has bottom lines in this massive um, this bill. And President Trump is going to be at the table, and that's one of his bottom lines. So I'm sure there are bottom lines that Chuck Schumer is going to get that I'm not thrilled with. I'm sure there are bottom lines that Nancy Pelosi is going to get that I'm not thrilled with. But. Uh, Donald Trump has made it apparent that one of his bottom lines is the wall. It's what he ran on. Everybody knows that it's the most important thing to him. And therefore, if the government gets shut down, I don't really blame Donald Trump. I blame, if, if, um, if we don't get 60 votes in the Senate, I blame people who aren't giving him his number one. And we all know in a negotiation, there's some things that are more important to one party than the other party. And that is something that's very important to him. So I, I, you know, I mean, if we don't get an agreement, it takes more than one person not to get an agreement. One more question? Well, sure. We'll see how. Ben Lanza. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna just my uh, question is about illegal immigration. Right. And the reason why, when I came in this country, I had a green card. And I did all the guidelines that were given to my father, who only went to the second grade, so he was not a college graduate, and he knew what to do. We filed the paper, we came in the United States, we did everything illegal, we, and then we didn't do anything illegal. I do not like illegal immigration. It's a severe problem. I travel on my job, I work on the healthcare overseas. I know what the social medicine does. I've lived for 23 years. I can give you stories that you'd be crazy to think about. But illegal immigration is gonna be a big, Problem. Not for this country overseas. Look in Europe. My little town where I was born, there is almost 30 to 35 percent illegal people. They cannot, in Italy, they cannot control anymore. Why today the government of Illinois just signed sanctuary city for the state of Illinois? That's a crazy thing he can do it. So, in other words, people can come illegal and do what they like and want to do. I'm not, I'm here for legal re residents. Do the paperwork, wait in line. Illegal, I'm sorry, go back where you came from. You're 100% right, and for whatever reason, there are a disturbingly high number of Americans who can't figure out the difference between legal immigration Maybe they should all them, illegal pay the expense like my grandfather did, right. and then I see how many you, are forward for. Right. You, you cannot operate a country with anybody under the sun can come here. And the immigrants that we let in today are going to determine what type of country we have in America 10 or 20 years from now. If you have two identical people, otherwise identical people, or what appear to be identical people from a foreign country, will say, Italy, are you from? Is that what you said? I'm yeah, from Italy. Italy, okay. If we have two people from Italy, and one person's filling out the forms and trying to come here illegally, and the other person's trying to slip in the country illegally, in the long run, who's going to make the better American citizen? The person who's doing it legally, right? That's obvious. They get all and the benefits. Are, right. We are going to continue to allow immigrants in this country. But in the, in the question as to whether or the opinion, apparently, of past administrations, and I'm not just talking about Obama, I'm talking about Bush as well, these people who don't think the immigration laws are that important to a force are going to ruin America because we're going to have a significant number of people coming here, not all bad people, 
but a significant number of people who come here right off the bat, they're breaking the law to come here, and those people are disproportionately, you're right, not going to be working, maybe they're putting stress on the criminal justice system, they certainly may be using the medical system, which drives up the cost of medical care for everybody else, and our country will be sunk unless we begin to treat our, take our immigration laws seriously. Any country has to take the immigration laws seriously. Otherwise, you're going to turn around and you're going to get tens and tens of people who don't belong here, who kind of have contempt for the system. It is one of the reasons why Donald Trump was elected and I voted for him, is he promised to take the immigration laws seriously. And, I mean, we don't have to do it, but if we don't do it in 20 years, our country will be gone. Um, we do not want the United States to become the welfare magnet for the Western Hemisphere, which it will be. Um, and, and it will just be a disaster. And I, I don't know what I can do because there are nice people I know, probably nice people in this room, who think that we, we, don't, have to, we don't have to take the immigration laws seriously. You know, we need more people in this country, we need more skilled people, we need more hardworking people, but we can't take everybody. There are, there are I don't know what there are now, about 196 countries in the world. Not everybody has to come here, right? Uh, and as we try to keep America to be a great country for your children and grandchildren, we want to, to the best degree we can, we want to make sure that the people who come in this country are going to be good people who improve America. And the best way to do that is enforce our immigration laws and to make sure that people don't come here illegally. That the first thing they don't do come to the United States is break the law, which should be obvious, but a lot of people don't get it. And believe me, there are plenty of other nice countries in the world. It is not the end of the world if people have to stay in many of these other countries. I like to believe the United States is number one. I think we're number one, but it's not horrible. They have to live in some other countries. They don't want to go any other country except the USA. I can tell you what clients I have overseas. No, they just want to come. That's the best country. No, I, I love Italy. It's my country, but I still go for the United States. They, nothing they could change it. People mind. If somebody doesn't like the United States, I would say get one away ticket. There will be a thousand people waiting for your seat to come here. That's right. I, I, well, you're right. Uh, all these people want to come here. A lot of I don't know what the figures are. There are not a lot of people leaving. <laughs> okay, should we take one more? I, I do want to go see a. Well, I hate to do it out of line because I see one of my good buddies in the back. And I want to we'll, 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 we'll withdraw him out of it. Terry and Let's not take another Obama. We've asked, we've asked that one, answered that one many times. Can we, can we flip topics a little? There's a lot of people that have questions. They're all healthy. They're all healthy. May I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take you because we'll, we'll, because you look like a nice guy who's been a great citizen of Fort Washington forever, so we'll, we'll trust you. Well, I agree. Here's a question. You mentioned the notion of a 9% increase in the defense budget. Correct. I recently read about an aircraft carrier which has been commissioned and uh, was multi billion dollars in one ship. I was, uh, I was a Vietnam era, era hospital farmer. I did a good job. I didn't have to go to Vietnam. I was lucky when I was here. Uh, but my understanding is that we already invest more than about 20 of the major countries of the world in defense spending. And we're going to increase the budget by 9% according to you. Probably so that we can have more trucks built up here in Oshkosh. Had the pockets of the people who live here in this area. And for what purpose? When, in, in, when we have no evidence, really, that, that, uh, that we aren't already the strongest country in the whole world. And okay. I, it seems to me that you and other people like you who will vote for a defense bill like that, when you're taking services away from human beings, young and old alike, disabled and non-disabled alike, 
should be ashamed of yourselves. Well, I'll give you a couple of comments. Um, first of all, Donald Trump proposed a five and a half percent increase, and I told you I was okay with Trump. Um, there were over a hundred Republican Assembly uh, congressmen who signed a letter saying they wanted over an eleven percent increase. I was one of the people who held it to nine and a half. Okay, I and mean, that's just reality. Um, my opinion is we're going to audit the Department of Defense sometime in the next year. That's and, and once we get the, the well, once we get rid of the the audit, presumably will give us more information as to whether that's necessary. If you talk to people in the military right now, when I talk to them, they will tell you stories of airplanes that aren't flying or boats that aren't ships that aren't at sea because they're lacking spare parts, that sort of thing. And I, I try to talk to the average guy, not the lifer, but the guy who, you know, just spent four years in the military and get his or her perception. And they uniformly say we have to spend money on these things. So I'm willing to go up five and a half. Um, as we talked about in other areas, there's places where you got to compromise. Okay, I think I was one of the most vocal ones that made sure that we didn't get an 11 and a half percent upper. And sometimes you got to take your wins where you can. Um, I think. I sometimes with the rest of the leadership or the leadership team had fought with me, but they wanted me to get out there and fight, and I did knock, uh, I think I did significantly knock down that figure with from other people wanting. I'll tell you something else, the United States has had a strong military. First of all, one of the reasons the United States has, a, has a, um, an expensive military is the amount we compensate our soldiers and sailors and airmen and women. Uh, is very generous compared to what some other countries do. I haven't been in the service. I, I, you know, I recently hired a guy who uh, uh, came back from Afghanistan, and I think it was important that they compensated him well for what he did. So I don't have a problem that our guys are a lot, a lot better compensated than the soldiers in Russia or China. And that's. I, I don't need comparisons yeah, yeah, with yeah, Russia and China. Yeah. Our, our servicemen aren't compensated enough. It's all in manufacturing, it's all in developing defense things. Systems that cost billions of dollars have never been demonstrated to work except why don't the, the windshield wipers on the airplanes work? Who, who approved those contracts? Who was in charge of this? It seems to me that the Defense Department and the people who represent us in government are doing an injustice when we end up paying $250 for a cigarette, ashtray, or a hammer, and things like that. Peace. There's something wrong. And I, here's what I want. I don't want to hear that you working to get it, the, the budget down fight, not fight, but the, the fight is some other. I want to hear that you're going to stand up and vote against the budget, the whole budget. I don't want you negotiating health care or defense or education well, or things for people. I, I think you will find out in the most recent appropriation bill for defense, I think maybe one Republican voted against it, but I think maybe like six Democrats voted against it. Am I right, Rachel, do you remember the vote? It was a, almost every Democrat voted for a budget of that size. Not that that's right. I'm just saying the Democrats are willing to vote for it. And uh, I and I drafted an amendment to try to cut it. They didn't rule my amendment in order, but you can check. Glenn Grothman, probably the only Republican out there, you know, introduced an amendment to try to reduce the spending by 1%. And Glenn Grothman was one of the guys who uh, was able to lower the increase to 9.6. I will say something else. Uh, and actually, it's a Democrat who, who talked about me about defense spending here. It hasn't been a perfectly stable world for the last 70, 60 years, 70, 70 years. But compared to history, we've had a pretty stable 70 years. And the reason we've had a pretty stable 70 years is the USA is number one, and our military was number one, and people didn't mess with us. So if we cut back our military, the degree to which other countries become more rambunctious 
and more willing to get involved in adventurism. There's a cost to that too. I mean, it affects everybody's economy, it affects the world economy. So we do want to be number one. There's waste out there. That's why I fought so hard to hold down the defense men. Like I said, you got 241 congressmen. I bet it was the only one to reduce the amendment that got defense by 1%. So I, I have a lot of sympathy with you in that. And I think particularly when you have a, an audit coming out, you should wait for the audit before you have another upper. Uh, but you do want our military to be number one. And the reason I brought up the conversation for our soldiers, that is one of the reasons why we do spend more than other countries. If you read, like, the United States spends so much more than China, part of it is our guys and gals make a lot more than they do in China. What okay, about thank you. I'm for, wealthy. Uh, thank you. That. No, no, I mean, we're talking about money that we need. Yeah. And there's billionaires okay. out there, and yeah. what they're yeah. paying. Well, Can't we have it all, I mean, or more? i, I got to be the next place. People are going to say, okay. Glenn, you but missed it. But I think it's something to think about. I know, I, I do think about it, and I'm waiting on the taxes for the wealthy thing on other similar meetings. So thank you for all being here, and there you go.